Welcome to this new module. It will cover vital signs and basic EKG monitoring. After completing this module, you should be able to discuss the role of each of the four vital signs in maintaining homeostasis and the normal range for each of the vital signs, explain the indications for and types of oxygen therapy, describe the use and placement of lines and tubes, and explain the cardiac conduction system, including the electrocardiogram waveform components. Signs and basic electrocardiograms, or EKG monitoring, will detail the following topics. What is homeostasis? Vital signs? Oxygen is a drug? Oxygen devices? Chest tubes and lines? And finally, basic electrocardiogram monitoring. Homeostasis is defined as the process our body uses to keep a relatively stable internal environment. Even as our bodies react to the external environment, in order to maintain good health, our bodies will naturally adjust in order to keep the internal environment stable. The primary means that our body uses to maintain homeostasis are the pulse rate or heartbeat, blood pressure, body temperature, and respiration rate. These are our vital signs. Vital signs can be obtained quickly in the clinical setting and are an objective, non-invasive evaluation of the patient's immediate condition or response to therapy. Vital signs may be the first clue of adverse reactions or responses to treatment. Improvements in the vital signs are strong evidence that a given treatment is having a positive effect. Vital signs are non-invasive and can be assessed quickly. They provide objective data, which will reflect the patient's immediate condition or reflect the patient's response to changing conditions. The body's steady state is maintained by adaptive responses that promote healthy survival. The body is constantly changing and checking the external environment and adjusting the internal environment to meet survival needs. For example, if the outside temperature gets too cold, the body tries to maintain the internal temperature by shivering to generate heat. This type of response is termed feedback. Feedback mechanisms may be of two types. Negative feedback will resist or reverse the process if any of the vital signs go out of range. Positive feedback will accelerate or encourage a change with a specific end point in mind. The body's feedback processes are predominantly negative. Examples of negative feedback are blood pressure, the regulation of blood sugar, blood pH, blood gases, fluid balance, 
and erythropoiesis, which is the development of red blood cells to maintain sufficient oxygen delivery to tissues. If the kidney detects low levels of oxygen in the blood, they respond by releasing the hormone erythropoietin when they travel to the red bone marrow to stimulate the marrow to begin red blood cell production. In a positive feedback, when the skin is damaged, the damaged tissue causes platelets to adhere to the areas of damage. The platelets continue to attract more platelets, forming a mesh to trap blood cells and platelets and eventually forming a clot. We will now review the details of vital signs to include body temperature, pulse or heartbeat, respiration rate, and blood pressure measurement. Body temperature is a measure of the degree of heat of the deep tissues of the human body. Humans are warm-blooded and cells of the human body function best within a narrow range of temperature variations. Body temperature must maintain a relatively constant level despite extremes in the external environment temperature. Thermal regulation is the term used to describe the body's maintenance of heat production and heat loss. The hypothalamus plays an important role in regulating heat loss and can initiate peripheral vasodilation and sweating. It can also preserve heat by initiating shivering to generate heat. The respiratory system also is important in removing excessive heat by way of ventilation. Perfuse sweating is termed diaphoresis. The normal range for an adult body temperature is 98.6 Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius with a plus or minus 1 to 2 degree variation. There are five common methods used to measure temperature. Oral measurement by placing the thermometer under the tongue for 20 seconds to 3 minutes. The normal reading is 97.7 to 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit or 36 degrees Celsius to 37.5 degrees Celsius. The temporal measurement is measuring the temperature across the forehead to the temporal bone. This temperature is close to core body temperature and is the preferred route for temperature measurement. The reading is about one degree higher than oral temperature. Tympanic measurement uses an electronic thermometer in the ear. It is placed for about three seconds and gives a range of 95.9 to 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Axillary temperature is the least accurate and the least used. The thermometer is placed in the axilla for 5 to 10 minutes. The range is 96.5 to 98.5 degrees Fahrenheit or 35.5 to 37 degrees Celsius. A rectal temperature places a rectal thermometer in the rectum for 2.5 to 5 minutes. It is mostly used with babies. 
the normal readings are one degree higher than oral temperatures. The range is 97.5 to 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit or 36.5 to 38 degrees Celsius. The type of thermometer used will depend on where the measurement is being taken. The electronic thermometer is most versatile. It has a battery powered display unit. Temporal artery or TA thermometers are used to provide accurate temperature with a non-invasive sweep across the forehead and temporal region of the head. Oral or tympanic thermometer is placed in the ear and the disposable thermometer are strips or tapes that are placed on the forehead. Oral temperature is taken by placing the thermometer under the tongue for 20 seconds to 3 minutes or until a stable reading is obtained. Oral is the most common method used to take temperature. When using an oral thermometer, the thermometer is covered with a disposable protective sheath and proper hand washing is utilized before and after patient contact to minimize infection spread. Axillary temperature places the thermometer in the axilla between the upper arm and the torso. The thermometer should remain in place for five to 10 minutes. Oral or tympanic places an electronic thermometer in the ear. An accurate reading can be obtained in as little as three seconds. This method is commonly used when taking the temperature of children. An erectile temperature is used on babies. The tip is lubricated and placed in the anus for 2.5 to 5 minutes. A fever is a manifestation of the natural response of the human body to increase cellular activity when combating an invading organism. With increased metabolic rate, the result is increased body temperature. Increased metabolic rate also needs more oxygen consumption and results in more carbon dioxide production at the cellular level. As metabolic rate increases, the cardiopulmonary system must work harder to meet the additional cellular demands. It must therefore provide more oxygen and eliminate more carbon dioxide. The opposite will happen when the body temperature falls. Hyperthermia is an oral temperature higher than 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit. The patient is said to febrile or to have a fever. Fevers are common with viral and bacterial infections as a natural response of the body to increased cellular activity. On the other hand, hypothermia is an oral temperature below normal 97.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Medically induced hypothermia can be used during some surgical procedures such as heart surgery to decrease the metabolic demands, therefore decreasing the pressure on the cardiopulmonary system. However, Cellular function is optimal only within a narrow temperature range. Therefore, 
prolonged hypothermia can lead to serious complications and cellular damage. Patients suffering from prolonged hypothermia may become confused, dizzy, and comatose. The cardiovascular system is a closed fluid system with a pump or the heart. The heart has blood vessels and sends oxygenated blood to the body while receiving deoxygenated blood. The right heart carries deoxygenated blood to the lungs and the left heart carries oxygenated blood to the body. The right vena cava carries deoxygenated blood from the body to the right atrium of the heart. The pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle to the lungs. The left pulmonary vein carries oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left atrium. The aorta carries oxygenated blood from the left ventricle to the body. The cardiovascular system functions to transport oxygenated blood from the lungs to the cells of the body and to return deoxygenated blood back to the heart and the lungs to become reoxygenated. Carbon dioxide, which is a byproduct waste produced at the cell level, is then removed from the cells to the lungs for removal. Three common sites are often used to palpate superficial arteries. The radial artery is located at the wrist by the base of the thumb and is the most common pulse point. The brachial artery is located in the groove between the biceps and triceps muscles above the elbow in the anti-cubital fossa of upper arm of infants. The carotid artery is in the front of the neck and is used during emergency care only. During CPR, pulse is usually measured at the carotid artery. In critical settings, the pulse rate may be measured with a pulse oximeter. The oximeter measures hemoglobin oxygen saturation of arterial blood. This instrument is a non-invasive light emitting probe that attaches to the finger. It can attach to the foot, toe, earlobe also. It can also be attached to the nose. The pulse oximeter measures the pulse and oxygen saturation. The oximeter converts light intensity into oxygen saturation and pulse rate values. In addition to the three main pulse points, other sites can be used to check the pulse. Other pulse points are apical pulse at the apex of the heart. This is not commonly used because a stethoscope is needed to take this pulse. Auscultation is the term used to refer to listening for the heartbeat using a stethoscope at the apical pulse. The femoral artery is located in the groin. This is used only during cardiac arrest to verify the effectiveness of chest compressions. A peripheral pulse 
indicates a systolic blood pressure of at least 80 millimeters of mercury. These sites are less common. The popliteal artery is located at the posterior surface of the knee, and the temporal artery is located in front of the ear. These sites are rarely used. The dorsalis pedis, or pedial artery, is located on the foot in line with the groove between the extensor tendons of the great and second toes. This artery can be absent. The posterior tibial pulse is located in the inner side of the ankle. When the pulse rate is measured, the second and third digits are placed over the pulse point and should be counted for 60 seconds for the most accurate assessment. On a normal patient, the pulse is measured for 15 seconds and the number is multiplied by four. In addition to recording the rate, the strength, and regularity of the beat should also be assessed. If any abnormal condition exists, the pulse must be measured for 60 seconds. The resting pulse in adults is 60 to 100 beats per minute. For infants, the rate is 100 to 180 beats per minute. For children, the rate is 70 to 120 beats per minute, with an average of 95 to 110. And for an athlete, the rate is 45 to 60 beats per minute. Tachycardia refers to a beat over 100 per minute, and bradycardia is less than 60 beats per minute. Tachycardia is an increase of more than 20 beats per minute for an adult, or a rate greater than 100 beats per minute. With tachycardia, there is an increase in cellular activity, which increases the demand for oxygen. When heart contractions increase, the pulse rate also increases. Bradycardia is a decrease in the heart rate. External respiration is the exchange of gases in the lungs and is physiologically a result of differences in pressure inside and outside the lungs. The respiration system is responsible for delivering oxygen from the environment to the tissues and eliminating carbon dioxide from the tissues to the environment. Cells in the body require a constant supply of oxygen for cellular metabolism. As a result of cellular metabolism, the waste product, carbon dioxide, is produced. Oxygen has to be continually supplied and carbon dioxide continually eliminated Otherwise, death occurs. During inspiration, the diaphragm contracts and moves down towards the abdominal cavity. The chest cavity expands and air rushes into the lungs. During expiration, the diaphragm relaxes to its original position. The chest cavity contracts 
and air is expelled. Respiratory assessment is a measurement of the lung volume. The tidal volume is the amount of air exchanged under normal conditions. This is measured as number of breaths per minute. An accurate assessment will include measuring the rate, including how fast or slow the breathing is, measuring the depth, determining if it is shallow, normal, or deep, and measuring the pattern of breathing whether it is regular or irregular. Respiration should be measured without the patient's knowledge because a patient can alter their breathing rate and pattern. The method used to check the pulse, then the respiration without letting the patient know the respiration is being checked. Always count for a full minute for a child since the rate tends to be higher than that of adults. Normal respiration rate is measured in breaths per minute. The normal rate for adults is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. For children under 10, the rate is 20 to 30 breaths per minute. For a teen or youth, they have a rate of 16 to 20 breaths per minute. And newborns have a rate of 35 to 60 breaths per minute. Tachypnea is the term used to describe respiratory rates over 20 breaths per minute. It can be caused by fevers, anxiety, chest trauma, decreased oxygen in the blood, and central nervous system. Increased cellular metabolism results in an increased demand for oxygen, leading to increased respiration needing to deliver additional oxygen to the blood. Bradypnea is a term for the decrease in respiratory rate. It occurs when there are fewer than 12 breaths per minute. This condition is less frequent than tachypnea. It can be caused by drug overdose, depression of the respiratory center of the brain, head trauma, or hypothermia. Dyspnea means difficulty in breathing, and apnea is the absence of spontaneous ventilation. Blood pressure is the measurement of the force exerted on the walls of arteries during cardiac contraction and relaxation. It is measured in millimeters of mercury. The measured blood pressure consists of two valves, the diastolic pressure or relaxing of the heart and the systolic pressure or contraction of the heart. Traditional blood pressure measurement requires two pieces of equipment, the stethoscope and the sphygmoid manometer. However, most modern blood pressure measurement is now made using automatic equipment. Traditionally, Blood pressure was measured over the brachial artery using an inflatable cuff. First, the cuff is inflated above the systolic pressure in the artery. Air is released slowly until the pressure in the cuff 
matches the systolic pressure, indicated by the sound of a beat. Continue to release the air until no sounds are heard. This is the diastolic pressure valve. In a critical care situation, the blood pressure may also be measured and displayed through a cardiac or vital signs monitor. The cuff is placed around the patient's arm and may be inflated automatically or manually by a healthcare professional at a timed sequence controlled through the monitor. Once the cuff inflates and deflates, blood pressure valves electronically display on the monitor. Once the cuff inflates and deflates, blood pressure values electronically display on the monitor. Normal adult pressure ranges from a systolic range of 95 to 140 to a diastolic range of 60 to 90. A normal systolic diastolic rate could be 120 over 80. Hypertension increases the workload of the heart. Pressure above 140 over 90 is hypertension. Pressure less than 95 over 60 millimeters is hypotensive. Hypotension may result from burns, diarrhea, vomiting, shock, bleeding, trauma, or heat exhaustion. Hypotension is generally desirable unless it is accompanied by clinical symptoms. The normal range for blood pressure varies by age. Children aged 8 to 11 have a systolic range of 105 plus or minus 15 and a diastolic range of 60 plus or minus 10. Adolescent children have a systolic range of 85 to 130 and a diastolic range of 45 to 85. And adults have a systolic range of 90 to 140 and a diastolic range of 60 to 90. Many factors can affect blood pressure. These include increased peripheral resistance resulting in an increased blood pressure, decreased pumping action of the heart results in a decreased blood pressure, increased blood volume results in increased blood pressures, Decreased blood volume results in decreased blood pressure. Increased blood viscosity results in increased red blood plasma and an increase in blood pressure. An increase in viscosity results in increased blood pressure. Increased elasticity of vessel walls results in a decreased blood pressure. Age affects blood pressure. Infants have the highest blood pressure and adolescent children the lowest. Gender can affect blood pressure. It is higher in men than it is in women. Body position can affect blood pressure. It is lowest when recumbent or seated, and blood pressure is also affected by the time of day. It is lower in the morning.
emotions, exercise, and general health status can affect blood pressure. Generally, good health, exercise, and lowering the emotional temperature results in lower blood pressure. And finally, blood pressure is higher after food intake. Oxygen is absolutely essential for life. It is a colorless, tasteless, and odorless gas that plays a critical role in efficient cellular metabolism. Oxygen makes up 21% of atmospheric gas or room air. Medicated air is filtered air under pressure. It is cleaner and drier than general room air. Oxygen is not flammable, but supports combustion. It is considered a drug and must be ordered as such. The primary clinical indications for oxygen administration are to correct hypoxemia, which is a decrease in oxygen concentration in the blood and possible tissue hypoxia, which is an inadequate amount of oxygen at the cellular or tissue level. In this section, we will show all the existing oxygen devices. The brain needs oxygen approximately every four to six minutes. Other organs that are sensitive to oxygen levels and cannot survive without any extended period without oxygen are the heart, the lungs, and the liver. Technologists cannot prescribe oxygen. However, the technologist can change a patient's oxygen tank if it is almost empty or provide a patient with oxygen therapy at the physician's request. When working with a patient on oxygen, do not kink, disconnect, or otherwise compromise any oxygen tubing. Also, the technologist should never remove a patient from oxygen without consulting a nurse or doctor. As a technologist, you have to know that oxygen devices may be continuous flow system or a conserving device system. Portable oxygen systems include a cylinder with a regulator consisting of a flow meter and pressure manometer. If oxygen is needed during an MRI procedure, it is important that the entire system be MRI compatible. This means that the entire system must be made of aluminum tanks or cylinders. It is important to check the portable oxygen system before transporting a patient to ensure that an adequate oxygen supply is available throughout the patient's transport period and duration of the radiographic procedure. The portable oxygen system must be secured during transport and should never be placed upright without support. The cylinder has two regulatory valves. One valve controls pressure and indicates how full the cylinder is, and the other valve indicates the rate of oxygen flow in liters.
The pressure gauge indicates how much oxygen remains in the cylinder. At full capacity, an oxygen tank is pressurized to 2,000 pounds per square inch. When the gauge indicates a pressure of 500 pounds per square inch, one quarter of the tank's capacity for oxygen remains. At a reading of 200 pounds per square inch, the tank is nearly empty. The flow meter is used to determine how much oxygen in liters per minute the patient will receive. The meter rate can range and vary from 1 to 15 liters per minute. There are two classifications of oxygen delivery systems. The low flow rate systems in which the oxygen is mixed with room air and high flow rate systems which control the entire oxygen supply to the patient. High flow rate systems give a consistent oxygen concentration. They are run at sufficiently high flow rates or control the percentage of room air mixing with the oxygen supply to achieve a consistent oxygen concentration. The most common low flow rate delivery system is the nasal cannula or prongs. The patient inhales oxygen from the cannula as well as room air. It consists of two soft prongs attached to the oxygen supply tubing. The prongs are inserted into the patient's nares and the tubing is secure to the patient's face. Oxygen flows from the cannula into the patient's nasopharynx, which acts as an anatomic reservoir. The fractional concentration of inspired oxygen varies with the patient's inspiratory flow. This system can deliver oxygen rates of 1 to 4 liters per minute, which is 24 to 36% of oxygen. Higher rates would dry out the mucosa. The advantage of nasal cannula is that it is easily tolerated by patients. The patient can eat talk, and sleep without disruption. A major disadvantage is that regular use will result in drying mucosa or nosed bleeding. Another low device is the simple face mask. Oxygen is delivered through a small bore tube connected to the base of the mask. Holes on each side of the mask provide an access for exhaled gases and serve to mix room air with the oxygen supply. The face mask can be used to deliver oxygen rates of four to six liters per minute, which is 35 to 60% oxygen concentration. Low flow devices require oxygen flow rates less than 5 liters per minute and are used for short-term oxygen therapy. The air entrapment mask is a high flow oxygen delivery system. The system is able to monitor and control 
the amount of room air entering the patient's lungs. This entrapment of room air maintains a concentration close to 100% oxygen. To avoid mucosal drying, humidity can be added. The air entrainment masks are not well tolerated by patients. They are hot, stick to the skin, muffle speech, and must be removed for eating. The non-rebreather mask is also a high flow delivery oxygen system. It is also called a partial rebreather mask. They have a bag attached that serves as an oxygen reservoir. It is capable of delivering close to 100% concentration when used correctly. The non-rebreather are not well tolerated by patients. It is hot, sticks to the skin, muffles the speech, and must be removed for eating. The aerosol mask can function as a high flow device. It can be added on the air entrainment or non-rebreather mask to supply humidity. A sterile bottle of water or distilled water is attached to the mask via tubing to increase humidity of the oxygen entering and helps to prevent drying of respiratory mucosa when high concentrations of oxygen is required. The system can deliver 21 to 100 percent oxygen concentration. The Venturi mask can also function as a high flow delivery system. The Venturi can be changed to modify the patient's oxygen intake as needed. Tents and oxy hoods are used to deliver oxygen to pediatric patients. The oxygen tent covers the patient's bed and the oxy hood is a plastic box that fits over the baby's head. These systems can deliver 21 to 100% oxygen. Often the oxygen source is connected to a large volume nebulizer, which provides humidification in the form of particulate water. Closed incubators are transparent enclosures that provide a warm environment for small infants with temperature instability. Supplemental oxygen can be added to incubators but may result in a high oxygen concentration. The primary purpose of an incubator is to provide a temperature controlled environment. The closed incubator can be used to deliver oxygen. The open incubator does not deliver oxygen. Ventilators supply oxygen through an artificial airway inserted into the trachea and connected by tubing to the equipment. The ventilator is used on patients who cannot breathe spontaneously or when their respiration is inadequate. They deliver a controlled respiratory rate with a preset respiratory volume. Imaging can be needed to confirm placement of the endotracheal tubing for patients on a ventilator. When imaging, care must be taken 
to watch for disconnecting tubing. Any malfunction can be life-threatening. The system allows a slack in the tubing to prevent condensed water flowing to the patient's lungs and potentially drowning them. Even flexing or extending the patient's head may adversely affect the placement of the airway and tubing. An alarm usually sounds if the patient's response changes or the machine malfunctions. The technologist should not silence or alter the ventilator alarm system without first seeking help or correcting the problem that caused the alarm. Continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP, is a machine worn at night or during times of sleep to treat sleep apnea, a sleep disorder in which a person regularly stops breathing during sleep for 10 seconds or longer. A CPAP machine increases air pressure in the throat, keeping the tissues in the airway from collapsing when a person inhales. A CPAP machine delivers air through a mask that covers the nose and mouth. Other equipment, like the nasal continuous positive airway pressure, can deliver air through a mask that covers only the nose, or through prongs that fit inside the nose. The mask that only covers the nose is used more frequently. CPAP is the most widely used treatment for sleep apnea caused by blocked airflow in the throat or obstructive sleep apnea. However, the CPAP can also be used as a minimal invasive ventilation system instead of air, oxygen is delivered through the nose or mouth. However, the CPAP can also also be used as a minimal invasive ventilator system. Instead of air, oxygen is delivered through the nose or mouth. In the nasal continuous positive airway pressure, or NCPAP, the mask only covers the nose. Air or oxygen is delivered through prongs that fit inside the nose. When imaging a patient on oxygen therapy, the oxygen device should never be completely removed from the patient for the purpose of taking a radiograph without the consent or supervision of a physician respiratory care practitioner, or attending nurse. The devices can be repositioned if necessary to avoid artifacts on the image. After imaging, the technologist must ensure that any tubing leading to the device is not kinked or disconnected and that the device is properly repositioned on the patient. We will now cover chest tubes and lines, including endotracheal tubes, tracheostomy, thoracostomy tubes, tissue drain tubes, central venous line, pick line placement, arterial lines, and pulmonary arterial catheters. An endotracheal tube is inserted in the mouth 
and down the trachea to establish or open airway and to maintain respiratory complications such as airway obstruction or oxygen delivery. When inserted in the trachea, a cuff is inflated to keep the airway open. The tube also prevents aspiration of foreign objects in the bronchus. A chest x-ray is often used to check placement of the endotracheal tube. An endotracheal tube is indicated when there is a need mechanical ventilation or oxygen delivery. It can be used when there is inadequate arterial oxygenation and upper airway obstruction, parenchymal diseases that impair gas exchange, or for impending gastric acid reflux or aspiration. The tip of the endotracheal tube should be five to seven centimeters above the tracheal bifurcation. If the tube is extended further, it can result in lung collapse. Atelectasis is the condition where the lungs will collapse. If there is no gas exchange in one or both lungs, part or the whole of the lungs will collapse due to failure of expansion or reabsorption of gas from the alveoli. It is therefore important to check the placement of the endotracheal tube. The most common method of assessment is a chest x-ray. A tracheostomy is a surgical opening into the trachea performed under sterile conditions. The procedure is performed to relieve respiratory distress caused by an obstruction of an upper airway or to improve respiratory functions by permitting better access of air to the lower respiratory tract. The thoracostomy tube, also known as a chest tube or intrapleural tube, is inserted into the pleural cavity to drain the intrapleural space or mediastinum. It can also be used to drain fluid or air from the pleural cavity to create a negative pressure to relieve atelectasis or to resolve pneumothorax, hemothorax, pleural effusion, or empyema. The insertion site for a thoracostomy tube will vary depending on the condition being treated and the intrapleural substance to be removed. However, a common insertion point is between the 5th to 6th intercostal space, laterally and in the mid-axillary line. It can be as high as the 4th intercostal space and as low as the 8th. A technologist performing a procedure on a patient with the thoracostomy tube should never remove the tubing and should avoid dislocating or disrupting airflow. The tube is inserted following a sterile procedure and should not be touched except in sterile conditions. The tracheostomy must be suctioned at regular intervals. This is usually performed by a nurse. When imaging, if the patient is difficulty breathing, seek assistance. Tissue drainage tubes 
are placed in or near wound sites or operative sites to drain fluid and promote healing. The tubes are put in place after surgery. Care should be taken to prevent infection at the site. The technologist should never remove the drainage tube. Central venous pressure lines are catheters inserted into a large vein. There are three types of CVP lines. Tunneled lines, peripherally inserted lines, such as PIC lines, and implanted ports. They can be used for a variety of applications to administer chemotherapeutic drugs and parenteral nutrition, to administer other drugs, to check body analysis, to monitor cardiac pressure, to manage fluid volume, to serve as a conduit for transfusions, and to monitor cardiac pressures. They are also called central venous catheters or venous access devices. The catheter can be single, double, or multi-lumen. The catheter is inserted into the subclavian vein or internal jugular or femoral veins and the tip advanced to the superior vena cava. The most common site for insertion is the subclavian vein, but it can also be inserted in the internal jugular and femoral veins. Whatever the insertion point, the tip is advanced to the superior vena cava. The final position should be approximately two to three centimeters above the opening of the right atrium. Tunnel central venous catheter, or CVC, are called by many different names. Examples of tunneled CVCs include Braviak, Hickman, Neostar, Leonard and Groschen. They are inserted surgically using two incisions. The exit site is typically a few inches above the nipple. The entrance or insertion site is just above the clavicle. The catheter is tunneled under the skin between the two incisions. The catheter keeps and needs regular deep flushing to keep it patent. Peripherally inserted CVCs or PIC lines are long intravenous catheters inserted in the arm. The tip is advanced to just about the right atrium. The preferred location is the superior vena cava approximately two to three centimeters above the right atrial junction. Superior vena cava placement is preferred because of its size. Infusions of intravenous fluids are much less caustic in central lines than in small peripheral veins. Implanted ports, sometimes called portacaths, are small devices with a catheter attached. The device is surgically placed under the skin, usually in the upper chest. The catheter is threaded into the venous system. When in place, all of the CVC is below the surface of the skin. 
This allows large volumes of fluid to be given quickly or medication that is irritating to be administered easily into a large vein. Implanted CVCs must be flushed regularly. An arterial line or A line is a thin catheter inserted in an artery. The lines can be used to measure intra-arterial blood pressure and allow accurate assessment for critically ill patients. With an arterial line in place, the physician will have a continuous measurement of systolic and diastolic pressure and the mean arterial pressure. The lines can be used to deliver saline or blood thinners to prevent clotting. No other medication should be injected into an arterial line. Common sites for placement of the arterial line include the radial, brachial, axillary, pedal, and femoral arteries. The most common sites are the radial, femoral, and axillary arteries. The modified Selinger technique is used for cannulation of deep arteries. This involves the use of a large, hollow introducer needle that is inserted into the artery. The angle, depth, and technique of insertion will vary depending on the specific site location that is used. One type of arterial line is the Swans-Gantz catheter. In Swan-Gantz catheterization, a thin catheter is passed into the right side of the heart and the arteries that are leading to the lungs. The technique is used to monitor the patient's function and the blood flow and pressures in and around the heart. The catheter incorporates a small electrode at its distal end, which is used to monitor pulmonary arterial pressure. At the distal tip of the swan's gants, there is a deflated balloon and an electrode. The electrode at the tip of the catheter measures pulmonary pressure. During pressure measurement, the balloon is inflated drifting the catheter into a small pulmonary artery where it wedges. After pressure measurement, the balloon is deflated. Technologists are not responsible for placing lines or leads in patients. However, the technologist will be imaging patients with various lines and leads. It is important for the technologist to recognize what is the focus of the imaging and how to protect and care for the patient during the imaging procedure. Technologists should be able to recognize correct placement and be able to identify any malposition on the radiograph. A suction catheter is used to remove body secretions such as mucus and saliva from the upper respiratory system. The catheter is connected to a suction machine or a suction collection canister. Suction is used on a patient who are unconscious or very weak and unable to expel mucus or clear sputum from their nose, mouth, or nasal pharynx by coughing or swallowing. Indications for suctioning can include audible rattling or gurgling sounds, 
coming from the patient's throat or other signs of respiratory distress. And finally, we shall cover basic electrocardiogram monitoring, which includes the following. What does the ECG measure? Cardiac function, the heart anatomy, layers of the heart, cardiac conduction system, EKG lead placement, EKG lead placement, EKG tracing or waveform, EKG analysis, radiographer's role in ECG patient care, common arrhythmias, and treatment of arrhythmias. The heart carries out a well-synchronized pumping action that distributes nutrient-rich blood throughout the body and sustains life. The beat is controlled mainly by electricity. The muscles of the heart are most affected by sodium, calcium, and potassium ions. The heart has three layers. The epicardium is the outermost layer, the myocardium, is the middle muscular layer, and the inner layer is the endocardium. The coronary artery and its branches supply nutrients to the heart and its muscles. Blood flow from the atria to the ventricles is controlled by the mitral or bicuspid valve on the left, and the tricuspid valve on the right. These valves ensure a one-way flow from atria to ventricles. The contraction and relaxation of the heart muscles is controlled by the cardiac conduction system. This is a collection of nodes and specialized neural conductive cells. These specialized neural cells originate in and transmit electrical impulses across the myocardium and regulate the rhythm of the cardiac cycle. Both atria contract together first, followed by both ventricles. The conduction system is independent of nerves or hormones and works automatically. It is influenced by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems and any abnormalities within the neural conduction system will create arrhythmias, which are irregular rhythms of the heartbeat. The conducting system consists of the sinoatrial node, or SA node, which is the pacemaker of the heart. The atrioventricular node, or AV node, the bundle of His, and the Persian fibers. The SA node generates an electrical signal which activates the atria. It can initiate 60 to 100 impulses per minute and is responsible for the rate and rhythm of the cardiac cycle. From the SA node, the signal travels to the AV node, then to the bundle of His and into the ventricles. The bundle of His sends the signal to the Pershing fibers of the ventricles. The ventricular contraction represents the heartbeat. The SA node is located 
in the upper posterior wall of the right atrium. The AV node is located in the right atrial wall near the tricuspid valve. The bundle of Hiss runs down the center of the heart and the Pershing fibers run from the center down to the apex and then outwards. Electrocardiogram or EKG or ECG monitoring is a measure of the electrical activity of the heart. It provides a record of the heart's activity and information concerning the heart's function and structure. EKG reports are recorded on an electrically sensitive paper. The acronyms EKG or ECG can be used interchangeably. To measure the electrical conductivity of the heart, electrodes or leads are placed on the skin. The skin must be cleaned, usually with alcohol, to ensure good connectivity. Patients with lots of hair on the skin may need to shave. Most modern electrodes are pre-lubricated. The 10 electrodes are placed, one on each of the four limbs, and six are placed at designated areas of the chest. The placement of the EKG leads is very important. Poor skin contact and poor placement will affect the readings. The EKG represents an electrical graphic display of changes in cardiac membrane potentials as a function of time. Each EKG waveform represents electrical activity within a specific area of the heart. The complete cardiac cycle has five identifiable waveforms. These electrical impulse patterns are P, Q, R, S, and T waves. The P wave is the atrial depolarization. The QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization, and the T wave represents ventricular repolarization. Atrial repolarization occurs during ventricular depolarization and is hidden under the QRS complex. The flat portion of the graph between the P and T waves is called the isoelectric line. Depolarization is the act of contraction of the heart muscles. It is a result of the action of sodium in converting of electrical charge of the cell into a positive charge. SA node depolarization is carried through the right atrium to the left atrium and results in a simultaneous contraction of right and left atria. Repolarization is the return of the cells to a resting state. When analyzing the EKG waveform, the key questions are the following. Is the rhythm regular or irregular? Are the QRS complexes similar and are they narrow? Are all P waves similar? And are P wave intervals normal? Is the rate normal? 
and do waves and complexes proceed in a normal sequence? EKG artifacts or errors can be caused by poor placement of the electrodes. Simple errors in electrode connection or patient movements can be seen as bizarre or ominous signs. Generally, if the EKG results are abnormal and the patient is alert and not showing signs of distress, the leads should be replaced and the EKG repeated. Technologists may be required to perform an EKG. Before performing the procedure, the technologist should explain the procedure to the patient. Electrode placement should be done while ensuring the patient's privacy. Some common arrhythmias are bradycardia or or abnormally slow heart rate, tachycardia or abnormally fast heartbeat. Ventricular tachycardia is caused by abnormal stimulation of the ventricles. It results in a very fast heartbeat. Fibrillation, fluttering or irregular heartbeat. It can be atrial called AFib or a ventricular fibrillation. Fibrillations can lead to blood clots, stroke, heart failure, and other heart-related complications. Premature ventricular contractions or PVCs are extra abnormal heartbeats that begin in one of the ventricles. These extra beats disrupt the regular heart rhythm, sometimes causing a feeling of flip-flop or skipped beats. An asystole is the absence of electrical activity in the heart or no heartbeat. There are a number of treatments in place for arrhythmias. Antiarrhythmic medication is the most common treatment. Others include cardioversion therapy, when electrical shocks are sent to the heart by placing electrode on the chest, cardiac surgery, cardiac ablation, when the sites of irregular signals are destroyed, and the placement of implantable devices such as the cardiac pacemaker or the implantable cardiovertal defibrillator or ICD. This concludes the module on vital signs and electrocardiogram. Prior to taking the examination, please reread the module objectives to verify that you have no additional questions to review. We hope you will continue on to the remaining modules in the Patient Care and Radiology series. Thank you for using medical professionals for your CE requirements. Thanks for watching. To purchase the full course and earn your CE credits, click on the link in the description or head on over to our website at www.medical-professionals.com. And while you're there, check out our All Access Pass, where you can get unlimited CE credits for your state and ARRT renewal for just $49.99. We also offer a host of free resources to make it easier than ever for radiologic technologists like you to achieve excellence. Check out our free radiology CE webinars, clinical reference guides, and free CE courses on our website today. Be more than just certified. Choose medical professionals.